Good evening. I'm Harold Pacious. We're on the air again with another edition of Pacious on the News. And tonight we have a very, very interesting guy, Dan Brennan, who is the head of Maine Housing. I always knew it as Maine Housing Authority, but it's the state agency that tries to help us solve our housing problems. Dan, welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate you reaching out. Well, you're a very nice guy. You come all the way down from Winslow, Maine. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I hope that uh, you'll have a, a pleasant evening after this in Portland. I am, I am sure, yes. Uh, we will so enjoy the great city of Portland. So, so uh, Dan is, as I said, runs the Maine Housing Authority, and all of us, you, me, we read in the newspaper every day about the housing crisis in Maine. And it takes many, many different forms. From, you know, you go by the park and you see a lot of homeless people, and that's part of the housing crisis. They have no place to live. Uh, that's a segment of the crisis. You read about people who say, rents are too high, we can't find a place to uh, rent. It's terrible. That's part of the housing crisis. You read about people who say, you know, we're trying to buy our first home. The prices are so high with nothing available. We can't find anything. That's part of the housing crisis. And most of it, I'll ask my guest if, if he agrees with this, but of course, you know, after all these years, I have my own opinions. But most of it relates to something called supply and demand. That is exactly the issue. Uh, over the years, over the last several decades, we simply haven't built enough housing units, let alone affordable housing units, but we simply have not built enough housing units for the population that needs housing. And that's not just in Maine, that's all around the country. So what we're experiencing in Maine, and you captured it very well by the different pockets of the crisis, uh, it's as bad as it's ever been, it's as challenging as it's ever been, but we have a state housing authority, we have a plan, we've got uh, hundreds and hundreds of people working on this, and we've also have support from our state and federal leaders that are helping us along the way. So I, I, I'm an optimist, I'm a hopeful guy, um, but we work very hard to tackle each one of those issues as best we can each and every day. So I think the news here, this is Patience on the News, is going to be the plan. Before I get to the plan, mm -hmm. I want to introduce you to Dan a little bit. So uh, Dan, like 45% uh, like of the rest of the people in this state, you ca originally came from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I did. I was, uh, I was born in the town of Braintree, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, and uh, lived there for the first nine years of my life, and then my family, my dad, uh, mom, we moved down to Cape Cod, and I grew up on Cape Cod in the town of Sandwich, graduated high school from there. And when you, uh, so I, I, I was very fortunate to uh, grow up on the Cape. It's a great place, my brother's still there, um, and I, 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 I love the Cape. But it gets a little claustrophobic. Particularly and, in the summertime, huh? Yeah, and so when you're 17, 18 years old and you've been doing that, you want to you wanna get away. Uh, I was familiar enough with the Boston area and I'd been there, done that. So I wanted to go as far away as I possibly could and I ended up in Orono, Maine <laughs> and had the best four years of my life in Orono, Maine, uh, getting a bachelor's degree at the University of Maine. And of course, th that, uh, with that came the good fortune of marrying a girl from Maine. That made you permanent, <laughs> right? Well, I don't know how those rules work. Yeah. But uh, no, I'm, I've, um, I've been very, <clears throat> very lucky. I, I, uh, I love the state of Maine. Uh, I've fallen in love with the state of Maine and, and it, uh, it's in my heart and it's in my soul. And so I love to go back and visit uh, Boston. I love to go back and visit the Cape. But this is, uh, this is where my, my life's work is and will remain so. So you've been with the Maine State Housing for a long time now. I celebrated my 30th year this past April. Really? Yeah. And so you've held a variety of positions there. Now you're the boss. Yeah, I came out of the banking world. I actually uh, worked right here in downtown Portland uh, working for Maine National Bank. 
working in their internal audit department. So you get a, a sense of how banks work. And uh, as it was very unstable uh, employment back then, and I needed something a little more stable. So I, uh, I ended up landing this job at Maine State Housing Authority in 1993 because they were looking to start an internal audit function. Maine State Housing Authority is a bank. It's an affordable housing bank that was created in 1969. And its primary purpose is to provide financing for people who are trying to buy their first home and also uh, to developers building apartments. So uh, you've been there all those years. And who made you the director? Who, which governor made you the director? Uh, Paul LePage, back in uh, 2018. Um, the, uh, our previous director had retired, and um, uh, the governor had made an appointment, and politics played out in, in the legislature, and the governor couldn't get along on that nominee. Uh, good man, uh, would have been fine. But uh, about an hour after that decision was made by the legislature, I got a call from the governor, uh, governor's office, and he asked me to come over and talk to him about the job, and and I did, and I decided to do it, and and uh, once I did that, it was it, it felt right, it felt very comfortable. And so the current governor, you 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 worked for Paul LePage for a number of years, and the current governor for the last four and a half years, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, but they tell me you're neither Democrat no, nor Republican. I am, I am proudly a, neither a member of the Republican nor the Democratic <laughs> Party, and that's by choice. Um, I love this country, I love our state, um, and I do follow politics very closely, but uh, I, I, uh, I, I personally am not a member of either party. And I don't, and, and, and so I'm not being a political guy, um, I don't want my agency to be political either, because what I've found is that Democrats and Republicans want to solve affordable housing problems, and I want to work with them. So I let the politics play out, and when they play out and all is said and done, obviously I interact with politicians of both parties willingly, try and help them make the best decisions that they feel they need to make. And once those decisions are made and funding decisions are made, our job is to spend that uh, and help uh, main people. And do you get, so, so do you get I know you deal with the legislature all the time and the governor's office. Uh, and uh, that's part of the job. But let's get back. To, it's a bank. So I, I don't think people think of your agency as a bank. Sure. Why do you say it's a bank? So we're a bank because um, we're, we're, we're partly a bank, a $2.5 billion bank. So that would make us about the fourth or fifth largest bank in the state of Maine. And we're also an administrator of many federal programs where the government pays us a fee and we, we help people out and we can talk about that a bit. The bank side, Harold, is uh, most banks run by depositors coming and depositing money into the bank so the bank has money to lend out and help people do, do their thing. Um, our type of bank we borrow money by selling tax-exempt bonds on, on Wall Street. And the legislature gave us that authority. So we're able to raise money by, by borrowing it from bondholders. And we can typically raise that money at a lower interest rate than community or commercial banks. We can then lend that money out at a lower interest rate to people who are making lower incomes for first-time homebuyers. Or we can use that money and other monies we get from the government, subsidies we get from the federal government to help developers lower their cost of debt for the apartments that they are building and therefore they can charge a lower, um, a lower rent. The rent levels are set by the federal government. The income levels are set by the federal government. So we work in our own um, unique world which is um, a construct that plays out in all 50 states. We're, we're a housing finance agency. You're a housing finance agency. So um, if I were a young person, I read about these young couples that want to get a house and so forth. Interest rates are pretty high. Prices of the houses are high. So I need to get a, a loan. Yep. What, how would I? end up connecting with Maine Housing 
Sure. Well, first of all, we have a great website, mainhousing.org. There's a whole host of information on that website. But what, the, what, that, what they would do is they would contact one of uh, about 40 different um, banks or mortgage companies that we work with. We do not lend directly to first-time homebuyers. We purchase mortgages that other organizations make. So people would go to their bank or their mortgage company, and that bank or mortgage company would offer them our loan product at our rate, which right now is 5.5%, which is much lower than the <coughs> market rate, which is up around 65 or 7 And they would make the loan to the home buyer, close the loan, and then they would turn and actually sell it to us, and we would buy it from and them. And would you service the loan? We have a uh, servicing contractor. We have a servicing contractor, which happens to be uh, the Rhode Island Housing Agency, yeah. because that's a line of business that they're good at, and they 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 uniquely uh, got into that servicing business. Servicing loans is very complicated, but right now Rhode Island Housing services all those loans for the people in Maine. So if so, in my example, if uh, I, I went to the bank and I said, look, there's a $350,000 home I want to buy. Uh, I just got the contract. I made a down payment. I need to finance this. Uh, like a bank, I mean, that bank would say, okay, well, you got to put down a certain amount of equity. Got to have some equity. Uh, well, it depends on the type of mortgage product. Uh, we work with a lot of mortgage um, insurance companies and agencies, one of them uh, being the Federal Housing Administration, the Veterans Administration, and some of those products don't require any down payment. Okay. And if you're going to come to Maine Housing, we'll also offer you a $5,000 grant for down payment assistance and closing cost assistance. Okay, so uh, let's say I'm a veteran and I, 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 I'm told that uh, I don't need a down payment on the particular program that I applied under, and the three hundred fifty thousand uh, I get from the bank, but then they sell the loan to you. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Three fifty might be a little high, and and we're usually uh, right around two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. Again, we're statewide. I was going to say that statewide is important because. You don't find too many yeah. 350,000 around here, but you go to Rooster County, every house is under 350,000. You know, and that's part of what we're trying to do is, as we talked about our plan, one of our plans is we need to build, we need to have the state of Maine, whether it be through Maine housing or the private market, build more affordable, build homes cheaper, which is really hard to do in this environment right now. So some of the monies we get from the, uh, state and federal government, in this case the state government, through, through Governor Mills and the legislature, we're, we're, we'll give a housing developer a grant of up to sixty or seventy thousand dollars per home that they build so that they can then lower the price of that home making it more affordable to that first-time home buyer uh, that, that we just talked about. Do you pay attention to spreading it out geographically around the state? I mean, very much so. Um, the lenders that we use are statewide. Um, what we find is a majority of our loans are uh, outside the Cumberland County area. I think just for what you just said, that the pricing is just so, so high yeah. that um, a lot of our loans uh, are along um, the uh, western uh, coast part of Maine or, or up in the, the central and northern part of Maine. Um, on our website at mainehousing.org, we've got a, uh, a production dashboard where people can go on and actually see where loans are made and it's really helpful to people who analyze housing trends in Maine and analyze what we do but we care very much about making sure that there's geographic distribution of our product throughout the entire state. I find this particularly interesting because uh, I was brought up in a household where this business was conducted. My father who was a Greek immigrant came to this country when he was nine years old with his parents, uh, but ended up by pure luck in a nice job as be with the Prudential Insurance Company. Mm. And uh, I don't know how, whether the folks here are interested in this story, 
but I am, so bear with me for a minute. <laughs> so uh, he was in Newark. He was a young man. He had a job in Newark where their headquarters is, and he became a mortgage loan appraiser. And then they sent him out to the field, and one of the places he was was New Haven, Connecticut, where I was born. So uh, in 1939, they got contacted by the insurance commissioners of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And they said to the Prudential, you know, you, send, you sell a lot of life insurance policies in these three states, and you don't make any residential loans mm. in these states. So we're telling you right now, we want you to make loans. So my parents with me moved to Maine, and his job was to go around to all these small banks in the three-state area and buy residential loans. And then later they added commercial loans. So that's what he did. And when I was a kid, I would go with him. You know, he got these these houses, and he had his tape measure and his camera, and he, <laughs> he would do his, his, his appraisals and so forth. So I know a little bit about this. But in those days, all I remember as a kid, FHA, FHA insured. Yep. So that's the Federal Housing Administration. And they did federally what you do too here right well we're making the we're buying the loans uh, the folks that are insuring the loans uh, uh, our largest insurer is US rural development um, and and they insure 50 to 60 percent of our loans and you're right we're serving as as a very similar uh, to to the Prudential where we're actually buying those loans so back coming out of President Johnson's Great Society yeah. in the late 1960s found the uh, the start of, of these housing finance agencies around the country. And many state legislatures started putting them together and putting them in legislation and creating them for the ex express purpose of being a place where lower income individuals within any state can get access to capital so that they can buy their first home. So the capital that you have, you raise through bond issues. Yes. And... Uh, and the loans are insured, which means that me, as a bondholder, I have a little bit more comfort that this is an insured loan. Exactly. And exactly. that helps that, that, that helps the credit. Yes. And so I say, okay, I'm going to buy main housing bonds yep. because I think it's low risk. These, these, these are insured, these loans. They're not going to go belly up because the loans are insured. That and the financial stability that we have built over the last 50 years, bonds are issued out of a thing called a bond resolution. And that bond resolution, every time you sell bonds, and we sell them four or five times a year on the single family side for anywhere from 40 to 50 million at a time. And each and every one of those bond sales that we do has to be rated by Moody's and Standard and Poor's and Wall Street, the rating agencies. And those rating agencies take a look at main housing and they say, okay, you've been in business for 50 years. You've got this loan portfolio. We're going to give you a rating, but we're going to base that rating on how strong are you. And they put various financial stress tests to say, if everybody, you know, stopped paying their mortgage all at once, would you still be able to survive as an organization in, in, in scenarios like that? Our bond rating is a double A plus double A which is, in financial terms, very, very strong. You've heard of a AAA bond. Yeah. We're just below a AAA bond. And that gives us the financial strength because, as you said, that we, we're essentially negotiating with bond buyers to say, we, we want to get the lowest possible rate on our bonds so that we can pass on those savings to our customers. And that's how that all works. And you, so you raise that money in, from bondholders uh, and... One of your programs is to help people buy a house. How much, how much money has Maine Housing got invested in housing in this state? Well, I can tell you that we have $1.6 billion worth of bonds outstanding. We have about uh, 11,000 single-family loans right now in our portfolio. Um, 
since our inception, and, and we did our very first bond sale in, in 1972, um, $8.86 billion. So in terms of the money that we have borrowed and invested back into, um, into Maine, Two and a half billion dollars in assets. Most of that is in those mortgages. So we are a substantial financial organization that is specifically designed to help the lowest income people in the state, not only buy their homes, but also provide money to developers to build more apartments because we also need more rental apartments in the state. So with the single family homes, you're helping the buyer buy it. With the rental apartments, you're subsidizing it in a way which I want you to explain right. to help people be able to rent an apartment. And you're dealing mostly with the people who need to be in the affordable category. Yeah, yeah. They're not in the, in the, in the unlimited market. They need affordable help. Exactly. So short history on federal investment in affordable housing going back into the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. The federal government directly would invest in the construction and creation of affordable housing, and they did that through um, USDA Rural Development Program, had a program where a developer could build an apartment building and they get a 50-year, 1% mortgage. And then a rental assistance contract to help those folks pay their rent would be put right on top of that building. Same building. Same building. So the people living in that apartment would only pay 30% of their income towards their rent. That still exists here in Maine today. There are several hundred rural development projects with those contracts still in place. Public housing. We have public housing authorities, about 25 different public housing authorities around the state. And they created and they actually own public housing. Works very similarly where the people living in those homes make 30, uh, only have to pay 30% of their income towards their rent. HUD did the Section 8 project-based program up until 1983. So you have, between those three programs, you have thousands of units in Maine that exist today that are subsidized by the federal government for people at 30% of income or below. That production largely stopped in the mid-1980s, and the government pivoted, the federal government pivoted, and created a different way to go about creating affordable housing. And they did that through a program called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. They turned to the tax code and they offered tax credits as the vehicle to attract developers to build affordable housing. But they increased the income limits up to 50 and 60 percent of area median income. So we're not, we're not necessarily hitting the 30 percent. So what we saw there was the, num the, the people that were being served were a little bit higher income, and the volume went down dramatically. So you go through the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s to today, the number of affordable apartments that have been created is a fraction of what it used to be, and that's why we have the demand supply problem. This low-income housing tax credit program, the way it works is, Main housing will allocate the credit to the developer. The developer can't really use the credit, but they sell it to an investor. So this tax credit actually goes to a private company. Yeah. So if I want to be uh, an investor in a development company and in, in a project, yep. they say, okay, you invest $50,000 in this project and you'll get tax credits. And, there are, and there's a market for the tax credits. There is a market for the tax credits. Um, they're basically sold through syndicators. So uh, here in, in Maine, a company called Evernorth, formerly known as the Northern New England Housing Investment Fund, they've rebranded and now they're called Evernorth, say right here in Portland, Maine. They go around to various companies and organizations that are looking for tax credits to offset their tax liabilities, and they pool together investment funds. Developers come to me, my organization, for these tax credits, and the developers then are connected with the syndicator who has the investment and cash. So let's take a $10 million building. With one of these types of credits, the developer could get about $7 million worth of cash to meet the $10 million required. 
They only from, need from the, guys that say, I'll, I'll invest 50 million because I want the tax credits. Yes, and that tax credit lasts for 10 years. So that $7 million comes in, the developer then uh, using some, uh, we might look at, remember, the rents are going to be restricted down by, by the federal government. The revenue that they can drive is lower. So they can't afford as, as big a loan. Maybe they can only afford a million and a half loan on a $10 million building. But all those people are going to be served. So now they have a million and a half that they need to find. That's where the state government and federal government have invested in us, and we have those subsidies. So that's how it works. It's, it's, it's very, very complicated. And I hope I... I, I, I it, it is complicated, but I think... I think the audience should understand. You've kept it understandable. So the, the, the tax incentive program now is bearing most of the burden and providing you most of your tools to get things built. The, the U.S. Treasury Department is our affordable housing uh, supplier in, in the country. Um, there are two types of credit, one which will yield that $7 million for a $10 million building, and that's capped. We only have so much of that to spend. But there's a lower uh, cost credit that uh, we, one we call a 9%, one we call a 4%. The 4% um, the program is unlimited. So the federal government is basically saying to the states, we're going to forego tax revenue on these tax credits for you to go ahead and build affordable housing. But in Maine, because rents in general in Maine are lower than they are the rest of the country, you need another subsidy source. You need another pot of money that you can loan at 0% with no repayment to help that developer cover all the costs that he or she may be incurring in the development of the project. We provide that money. That is the, that is the fuel that allows Maine housing to increase the size of our pipeline, which we've done in the last five years. We used to be able to do about 200 units a year, 200 new units with the, all the tools that we had. Right now we have over 3,500 units in our pipeline. In 2023, we, will, we have 1,000 units that are either going to be completed this year and online, many right here in Portland, uh, or start construction in 2023, or complete in 2023. Another th th thousand. There's another 1,500 units behind that that are in our pipeline that are going to start You're construction. You're telling me that right now in this program, you are going to produce for this state 3,500 apartment units? As over the next, say, starting right now, yeah. some which might be done tomorrow, Yeah, <clears throat> and some which will be um, 2025, 2026. Okay, but in the, in, in the three or four, next three or four years. Yeah. But we gotta keep going, right? We gotta keep going, we can't stop there. Yeah. So that's why working with, the, I talked about um, the uh, legislative session that's going on right now, and I've been using the term potentially historic because the legislature is actually looking and the governor put into her budget $80 million of this subsidy money for us at Maine Housing to help developers do another 3,500 or 4,000. Of, of affordable apartments? Of affordable apartments all throughout the state of Maine. $80 million in the budget. We've never seen that level of investment, not only from a governor, but the legislature set up a joint select committee on housing. And that committee has endorsed this approach as well. They've done wonderful work. That committee's both parties, huh? Both parties. Yeah. And they've done wonderful work, really hard work, and they're, they're a joint select committee, so they're going to continue to exist after this first session of the legislature is over, and we're going to continue to work with them. But there's a level of investment going on right now in affordable housing from our state leaders that we've never seen before, and we're very grateful for it. But we know that we can take this money and apply it and make good things happen to help this supply and demand problem over time equal out. Once you equal that out, then rental rates may come down, affordability may get easier. As supply grows yes. and demand diminishes a little because of more supply, yeah. 
hopefully that will have an ameliorating effect on prices. That's the plan, that's the strategy, yes. So we've covered housing, you know, loans, people, particularly first-time buyers. We've, we've talked about affordable apartments. Many of the people, when they think of the housing crisis, they think of driving through Deering Oaks and yeah. seeing tents and so forth. That's another prong of the housing crisis, isn't it? It absolutely is, um, and it breaks my heart just, just coming here tonight um, and, and coming into to Portland. Um, and my heart breaks for, for every individual that's out there. Um, we have been uh, working with uh, homeless advocates, uh, practitioners in homeless shelters, um, state and local officials for many, many years to come up with a strategy of, of how to help the situation. Um, when the pandemic broke out and we were all on Zoom and uh, had to do our legislative hearings on Zoom, uh, previous to becoming director, I had been in a position where I was very close to overseeing the work of the homeless shelters in Maine. I've been to every single one of them. And they were overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed before the pandemic. And they were structured in such a way, and not only here in Portland, but let's get as many people into a small space as we can out of the elements. And, um, and then in the morning, and they sleep, and then in the morning they gotta go out onto the street, and then they come back at five o'clock, and uh, it just wasn't a very, um, very strategic way to, to go about. So the pandemic hit. We had to separate people. You couldn't be next to another person. So we very quickly um, stood up, helped stand up with the help of the university system and nonprofits, uh, Preble Street here in Portland, the city of Portland, um, shelters. We did one at the University of Southern Maine at, at Sullivan Gym. And what we found is when you separate people just by a little bit and give them a little bit of privacy, it's a little more humane. It's a little bit better way to go about housing. Um, we've talked about housing first and we've talked about the how you know the approach of housing first of getting services to people who have had the ability to have a good night's sleep a cup of coffee and a shower they're in much better they're in a much better place to be able to address the problems and issues that led to well, the homelessness. What, what, is, what is housing first? You mentioned housing first. So housing first is a national best practice on how to deal with chronic homelessness. And what that means is that there is no barrier to getting a housing unit for someone who is chronically homeless. Get them their housing first. And the because way we, you gotta have the housing. Right, and so the way we do that is we uh, we're a bank. We, it's an apartment building. It's, you know, we, we do that all the time. So we can, uh, we can finance an, uh, a Housing First project. We've done three of them here in Portland. Uh, we can also provide, because of some other federal resources we have in the term of the housing vouchers, we can provide the cost to operate the property for the owner by giving a voucher to the person living there, and they, their rent will be paid. So, uh, let me get an example for the folks here. So you've done it three times here, and we're talking about people that are really in hopeless situations on the street, giving them a place to live and services, which one without the other doesn't work very well. It doesn't. The, the problem that we've had is that we've never had a dedicated funding so service, uh, I'm sorry, a dedicated funding source for services. And right now in our legislature, LD2 is the name of the bill is a Housing First bill, sponsored by Speaker of the House Talbot Ross. Right now as we speak. It's right now as we speak. Yeah. And the governor has also endorsed this and put it into our budget. Again, let the politics play out of how that all comes, but there's a very high likelihood that a dedicated revenue stream has been identified that already exists, that was going to the state's general fund, is going to come to service providers through the Department of Health and Human Services to provide services. So we need about 10 more of these. We need 10 to 12 more well, of these properties. Hold on before you go to the revenue stream, because some of these people, you know, some are always worried about their taxes. Sure. Say, oh, more, say more spending. 
Hold on. The, yeah. deb the de dedicated revenue stream is a tax that already exists. It's the real estate transfer tax yes. that produces a lot of money in our budget, goes into the general fund. So it's there. It's been coming in for years. Yeah. Real estate transfer, all these people that come up from New York and buy a big house in Bar Harbor, they pay a real estate transfer tax. And that money is going to be used for Housing First. It is. It's the dedicated revenue stream for services, the missing piece of the puzzle. Once that's in place, we will be able to work with housing developers here in Portland, in, in Bangor, Lewiston, wherever, wherever developer wants to put a Housing First project, and they will have the comfort and the investors, remember, these are tax credit deals, too. The investors are going to have comfort that the building will operate and be functional and be successful because we've got three examples of them here in Portland. We know it works. Well, one of them, I think, is Logan Place. That was the first one. Yes. That was the first one. It was down near St. John Street yep. below the main medical center. Yep. And I think it was for women only, wasn't it? Well, we've, we've, done, um, we've, we've done Logan Place. We've done Florence House, which is off St. John Street. Okay. Close, similar neighborhood, not yeah. too far okay. away from one another. Yeah. Um, and, is and that Lawrence, for women only? Lawrence, uh, Florence, Florence House is for women only. Okay. It's a very unique where it's a house, it's a shelter on the first floor and it's a, a permanent apartments on the second floor. Yeah. It's a wonderful model. And then Houston Commons was the third one that was most and recently you, done. You mean housing helped the developer build the building by providing the tax credits? tax credits and the housing vouchers. Actually, I, I stand corrected. Portland Housing Authority stepped up with the housing vouchers. Okay. Uh, so Portland Housing Authority was, was very important in that um, building. Yeah. But yes, that's how that works. And now the service providers are going to have a dedicated revenue stream that they know is going to be there that will be able to do maybe 10 more of these projects over the next uh, 5 to and 7 years. And the services, including detox, all kinds of things, right? It's, it's a 24-7, 365, round-the-clock care for the individuals in that building. Remember, these folks are uh, experience a tremendous amount of trauma in their lives. Well, they and, are, yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and many of them are mentally ill, and many of them are ab abuse drugs and are addicted and so forth. So the services are designed to stop this circle of trouble. It, it's to erase the demons and yeah. we've seen it happen. We, we've You've seen, seen it happen. We have seen cases where individuals were on the street and just not and just miserable and they come into a housing first property. First of all they're not going to the emergency room every other day. They're not going to uh, interacting with law enforcement. Um, there's a very high success rate of individuals going into these and then before you know it, um, in some cases, uh, going to school, getting a job, um, reconnecting, reuniting with family, um, just a number of success stories out of Housing First. And that's why this is so important and, and such a huge historic uh, thing that's happening right now. Well, uh, you, what you're saying is that uh, success is measurable. I mean, you can measure the effectiveness of this Housing First program by just looking at statistics regarding police calls, ambulance calls. Yes, exactly. And you know, statistics also plays a big part in the other part of the solution that we're deploying, which is um, I had talked about talking to the legislative committee on Zoom, and I just said, you know, we got to come up with a better way here with our homeless shelters around the state. We just have to come up with a better way. And over the last couple of years, we have been working on a homeless system redesign where we're taking the state of Maine, not we Maine Housing, but the statewide homeless council, the state's continuum of care. These are two large organizational bodies that have been set up for many years in, in Maine to tackle the issue of homelessness. The practitioners and the advocates got together and we have identified, broken up the state of Maine into nine hubs. And those nine hubs are geographically, uh, all represent the entire state. But the hubs are very specifically designed around the idea of let's take care of the folks that are homeless that are in our own communities and let's try and mitigate the number of people that are going from all over the state into Portland 
all over the state to Bangor, up in the county, all going to Presque Isle. And let's try and help each one of these communities work together to come up with a solution so that the, the um, solution on homelessness is shared more equally, more equitably around that the state. That they're all not coming to the same <clears throat> urban centers. Exactly. So that that would mean, for instance, uh, just to use an example, uh, Rumford. Yep. So would that mean that you would, you would part of the plan would be thinking about actually constructing such a facility a, 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 a in Rumford? What that would do is <clears throat> the folks in Rumford, the folks in Oxford County, the folks in Farmington, that geographic area, Maine Housing has funded a full-time position, an organization in each one of these hubs, to be a hub coordinator. The hub coordinator's job is to look around that hub and say, what are my resources here? What do I currently have? Farmington has resources. Rumford has resources. Um, and what's missing? Let's get the educators at the table. There's so many homeless youth in our schools. Let's identify them. Let's uh, talk with our first responders. Let that community come together because they have their geographic uh, area. Yeah, but what common. do they need? They need a housing first. They may need a housing first. They may decide, you know what, we don't have the resources to support a housing first, but maybe what we need is more navigators. So a navigator is a person who is connecting with an individual to help solve that particular person's housing problem, wherever they, maybe they're couch surfing. But that's not part of your agency. Oh, it most, yes. It is? <clears throat> We're at the forefront of helping support and provide funding to each one of these hubs. Okay, so let's go to the example of, let's say maybe there's enough critical mass so that between Farmington and Rumford, a housing first facility where they get all the services and off the street and everything uh, makes some sense. First thing you need is a private developer. That's correct. You need, a, <clears throat> you need private enterprise to say, okay, we can do this, we can get a return, and we can get investors, and we're going to do this. You get, need a private developer and or the host of developers we currently work with, which might be nonprofit organizations, yes. housing authorities, community action agencies. Okay, yes, so, yeah. the, so the housing developer could be a for-profit or non-profit. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, and for the most part, we find that the nonprofits are the ones that we work with. There are some really, really good for profits as well, um, but we work very closely with the state's community action agencies to help deliver uh, all of the services that we we all the other types of federal funding that we have. We work very closely with the Maine Association of Public Housing Directors, all the public housing uh, agencies, and then there are other small nonprofits that exist in each area. Uh, of the state. The homeless shelters in our state, uh, many of whom have done housing development before. Uh, Tedford Shelter in Brunswick has done some housing development. Um, Penobscot Community Health Center up in, in Bangor has done some development. So uh, we're there to help support whatever organization or group in that region wants to tackle their homeless situation. And the way, one of the key things is in each one of these regions is to get what's called a by name list. Let's not get just, the what? It's called a by name list. Let's find out exactly who by name who each they one are. of these individuals are. And let's do a deeper dive into collecting information about who they are, where they came from, and what their needs are. And have that consolidated because we need to we need a better data management system collectively throughout the state. So one of the things about the, one of the goals of this homeless system redesign is um, better quality data so we know what we're dealing with. And the goal is to get to what's called um, functional zero. You want to get to functional zero, which is homelessness. It's never going to go away. People will always, always end it. up homeless. Yeah. But you want that homeless situation to be as short as it possibly can be, and you want to have more people exit the system in a given period of time than come into the system. 
And if you've done that, you've achieved functional zero. And uh, Isn't we, mental health treatment a big piece of that? I mean, huge. Huge. Huge, yes. You know, when I think about it, because I'm old, uh, when I was growing up, we, I, I, I think I might have been telling you this story, but it was either you or somebody else. I played, when I was in high school, American Legion baseball in Maine, and every year I played for the South Portland team, and we were good, and we would go to the state tournament, one of the teams in the state tournament, every year. And the state tournament was held at the Veterans Hospital in Togas. And mm -hmm. the reason it was held there is there were a lot of long-term residents of the veterans home. Now this is the 1950s, only 10 years or less after World War II. So there was a l large number of veterans who would, you know, PTSB or whatever you call it, and that were there at the veterans home. They were long-term patients there receiving mental health treatment. Mm. And we, stay, we, st we, st we stayed there, we ate our meals there. We didn't stay, we stayed somewhere else, but we ate all our meals there. We were around there. We knew some of the guys that would come to the ball games. And these people were in a clean place. They got three meals a day. They got doctors examined. They got doctors making sure, and nurses making sure they took their pills. I thought that was humane, but people said, no, that's not humane to institutionalize people. Now yeah. they're on the street. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm not a mental health expert, but I, my observation uh, is maybe the pendulum swung too far in the other direction. Um, now I think there are cases that uh, that that uh, there was there was inhumane treatment, no question, in in Maine and elsewhere around folks with um, battling with uh, su mental illness, substance abuse disorder. Um, and and then uh, the the shift went right all onto the communities, but the services didn't flow with them. Did sir, services didn't flow with them? Now when you talk about housing first, yeah this bill that's being considered by the legislature, housing first, that is swinging it back toward services that were provided in, in institutionally. Yes, I think that's, that's a bit of the strategy there. Now, we also talk very closely with Maine's hospitals, particularly those that have uh, mental health facilities, the Maine Behavioral Health Association, about what their housing needs are because they've got They've got patients that are in their facilities that are really ready to go. They're really ready to move on and out move of, out of there. Yeah. But there's no place for them to go. And therefore, is there a partnership that Maine Housing can have with a housing developer and someone who's been in a hospital? And we've been able to achieve some of those types of properties um, as well. The, the work that uh, developer Kevin Bunker did right here in Portland on Freedom Place a magical place for women with substance abuse disorder. Um, more dignity, uh, more privacy, more ability to move on with one's life. So Maine Housing wants to be active not only in helping people buy their homes and people getting apartments, but also helping the homeless uh, community um, and, and the homeless providers serve homeless people who are experiencing homeless better. Uh, we haven't even talked about p helping people heat their homes and and uh, and and um, and keep themselves warm in the winter, which we also do. So we're an organization that takes a lot of pride in coming to work every day, helping the people of Maine that need so much help. And it's uh, the, the how do you task what do you have to do with helping people? How <coughs> you're in the <coughs> how you're in the capital business. You're a bank. What do you have to do with well, helping people heat their houses? Yeah. So the bank stuff is over here. The other part of our agency is we're a federal administrator for the, we're an administrator for the federal government on a number of programs, including home weatherization, the, the uh, LIHEAP program, weatherization assistance program from Department of Energy. Um, we, we, we help remediate lead paint from people's homes. We help people repair their homes. Maine has one of the highest home ownership rates with one of the lowest incomes. Meaning, and there's a and, a, and the oldest housing stock. So there's a lot of homeowners that are poor that are living in substandard homes. They need their homes repaired. Yeah, so I out. need my, so I'm living in substandard stock, let's say, in some town in Maine, and I don't have much money, and my place is falling apart. Yep. Uh, 
I call you people up and you help me? You would call your local community action agency. Okay, I call me. my community yep. action, and then and they get in touch with you? Uh, they're under they contract do? to us. And what yeah. do you do for me when you know, yeah. I want to? I want to. I don't want the whole place to crumble. What yeah. are you going to do for me? Well, they're going to send out uh, an inspector to your home. They're going to assess the situation, and they're going to put you in touch with the contractors. Now there are wait lists. There, yeah. are, there isn't nearly enough, but the community action agencies will go out to a person's home, assess the situation, determine a solution. If the heating system needs to be replaced, there are funds for that. Uh, we're trying to put as many heat pumps uh, in, in electric um, heat pumps in, in people's homes as we can to help uh, the, uh, the energy situation. Right. I'm a member of Maine's Climate Council, um, and we're very much involved in green energy and keeping, uh, you know, doing the right thing in building and constructing homes. Yeah. So uh, we're very, very active in that grant administration side helping people pay their rent through Section 8 vouchers, which are vouchers that people go around the state to private landlords with. Um, okay, so you're, you're, you're doing everything. But let me, what, what, what I'm sensing here is that we all see the homeless population. They're on the street. They're in, yeah. right in front of us, and we all, so we're all conscious of it. And as you say, it'll never be solved. They were always, for forever, there, there will be homeless people. There always have been and there always will be. But the idea is to, to, to rein it in and to provide services and to make it diminish the homeless population. I, I'm hopeful that we can solve chronic homelessness. I'm hopeful that with these tools that were being given by the legislature, that we can solve the chronic homeless where we see so many people on the streets and tents and, and chronically out there. Um, if you can do it, why hope. can't they do it in San Francisco? Well, California Home Housing yeah. Finance Agency. Yeah, I talked to my my counterparts. We're all we're all trying to do the same thing. Uh, wow. Well, yeah. with the, the idea of housing first. Um, housing first is active in California and okay. in San Francisco. It's just the um, at the, at that point, you know, you talk about the overall society of the haves and have-nots. And that's bigger than, than main housing. But uh, the, um, the number of people in need uh, is, is uh, over. Well, can we go back to the hopeful part? So we're in a state that's a little bit more manageable than California. So I sense from you some real optimism. I didn't anticipate this, that there'd be some significant changes in housing in Maine. You know, we, we help hundreds if not thousands of people every single day uh, the, our agency does and 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 the partners around the state that work with us are our community action agencies and and uh, public housing authorities and nonprofits that we work with we are solving people's housing problems every single day and we're succeeding the visual part is what is we there. People, what the people watching this program look at yeah they they don't see the measurable change. Yeah. There's still there's still much more to go. Um, you know, oftentimes someone will come into a homeless shelter, and they'll get counted, and they'll be tracked, and the statistic will be taken, and then they'll succeed, and they disappear. Right? We, we're not tracking them anymore because they've succeeded. They're out in society. So they're not a statistic anymore. They're not a statistic anymore, and so there are. Uh, I, I, I don't want to diminish the level of the problem. It's significant. But the solutions that are in place right now, um, when we can help one person get into their first home, we've succeeded. When we can help one person get out of a homeless shelter into their apartment, we've, done, we've succeeded for that particular family. Those are the successes that we have to keep looking at as well. But we can't take our eye off the larger strategy we've been talking about tonight and uh, really focusing in on continuing to use what is the best practice. And the, by the best practice, you're talking about in how we treat them or what services? The best, the best practice that is out there for their particular situation. So we, we really focus in on... Um, what are the best practices we can use? Housing first is a best practice in the issue of chronic homelessness. Um, 
using our tax exempt bonding abilities and being very creative about how we manage our bond portfolio is a best practice to make sure that we can get as many people into their uh, homes as we can. Reaching out to Maine's landlords as we've been doing to incent them to rent to a person with a Section 8 voucher where they might have reservations about that. Well, let's help with some down payment assistance. Uh, let's give a bonus to a, to a new landlord that wants to help uh, someone who hasn't helped before. Let's, um, let's assure that landlord that if it goes bad and your unit gets damaged, we'll be there for you. That's a best practice in helping landlords. So we look around our lines of business we try and identify best practices and go down those paths. What you're doing is you're energizing and motivating, in many cases, uh, the free market system, people who are participating, capitalists. Yes. You know, Theodore White was a great author, long gone now, but he covered all of the great events of the World for Life magazine from the mid-1930s until 1970. And he, he covered it all. And he wrote a book in which he talked about what he learned by observing all these things. And he said the greatest thing he ever saw was the Marshall Plan. Very few people ran it, but it was all about capital and using capital. And it taught him that there are only two ways that we move people, change things. And he says it's either he observed at the end of a bayonet or by kind of greasing their palms a little bit. Those are the two ways. And the second part is a capitalist system, and he says it works. We've got to wrap it up. This has been terrific. I've really uh, enjoyed this, and I've learned a lot. And I think you do a great job for your agency by explaining it, as you have, to the public. I really do. You've well, done a terrific as I, job. as I said earlier, it's an honor to have, um, uh, have you reach out to me and, and have me on here. Given, uh, give me the opportunity to talk about what we do. Thank you very much. And the honor is from the people that are watching, uh, not me. I'm the interlocutor. Anyway, thanks for coming. Thank you, Al.